Happy Mother's Day. It's such a wonderful thing to be able to honor your mothers and those who helped bring us into life, not only into life, but into the reality of life, what it really is and what it should be. And I thank God for mothers. It's not to downplay the fathers, but it's not your day today. It's, it's, it's Mother's Day, and you should be very proud and honorable, obedient, and thankful to how God brought us into this world. Isn't that amazing? God selected certain women to bear certain people to come into this world. Think of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Of all the women in the world, she was the one that God chose. Of all the places I could have been born, of all the women that could have gave birth to me, God selected that one woman who I called mama all my life, and still call her mama, uh, to bring me into this world. Thank you, Father, for mothers, and thank you, mothers, for what you have done to this society what you have done for the families. Thank you so very much. Let's give our mothers another round of applause. <laughs> Amen. 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 Today is a very special day. I know it's Mother's Day. I really wanted to speak about something on mothers. Select one of the mothers out of the Bible and do that, but <clears throat> it didn't go that way. Reading in the book of Romans, <clears throat> I was trying to come to a, the understanding of some chapters in Romans, and I just couldn't seem to get it like I wanted to get it. And one day this week was down, and I just kept reading, reading, reading. Of course, I like to bounce things off the, the bishop here. And um, I, 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 just, I just love studying and reading. And some parts of Romans I didn't understand. So I say, well, let me go back from the beginning. And after I started reading from the beginning of Romans, I got caught in the first chapter. Let me tell you why. I saw some things there that I didn't really realize it meant what it meant. We're talking about how God transforms us, how we go from where we were to where we are to where God continuous, continuously takes us. And the Bible is very clear about this transformation part, and I want to call today and a few weeks, Christ is our life. Christ, Christ is our life. In James chapter 4, verses, this is where I want to start. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. Here's what James says. In verse 13, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. A vapor, something that appears and then it vanishes away. It doesn't disappear. it vanishes away. In verse 15, he said, Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. See, we sometimes take our responsibility 
that we have to God in a very casual way. This is what James is saying. He didn't say it was wrong to plan. He said it's wrong to plan without acknowledging God. This is his point. Everything should be done for the glory of God. Everything for his pleasure. I have another scripture I want to read in the book of Colossians chapter 3. Paul tells the slaves there in Colossians, and there was quite a few of them there in chapter 3 and verse 22. This is what he says. Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Then he says, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. You do it for God. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord's Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Now, that is very, very important. I want to begin with that. We have to learn to live for God in all manners of life through Christ Jesus. We have to learn to live for God, and some people really don't take that that serious. So Christ is our life. Now that's, that's saying a lot. But in Romans chapter 1, it is a very, very good place to start. Romans chapter 1. I went back to Romans. I was on something else. But this, this is amazing how God did this. I just, I just read this and I say, this is, this is good. This, this is about transformation. This is real good. So Christ is our life. In Romans 1.14, here's what the Apostle Paul says. I am under obligation, both the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. Barbarians. It sounds like people who are really like cave people, jungle people who live way outside of civilization, and they have all different kind of ways to live. They're barbarians, if so to say. He said, I'm indebted both to the Greek, the barbarians, to the wise, to the foolish. So for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. The Greeks and the barbarians, Greeks called everybody who was not part of their culture a barbarian. We have different names for different groups of people who are not like Americans. And you could think of some of the names we call people of other nationalities and from other parts of the world. Many of the American people, we don't want them here. Like America belongs to us. <clears throat> like this land, we, we bought this land. I own this land just for a little while. But the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. They, they lacked the Greek and the Roman tradition. They didn't act like the Romans acted. The difference that Paul is talking about is not race, but culture. He says, I'm indebted to all cultures, whether it's Greek or barbarian, people who don't have a culture. They don't talk like us. They don't act like us. He says, I'm indebted for what? In verse 15, he says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome to preach the gospel. In verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel as that is, it is God's power to them that believe. Now, in verse 17, he says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. It is revealed in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. It is revealed. What is revealed? How God makes people right with him. That, that's what the gospel is. From beginning to end, 
It is through trust in Christ who is righteous our lives should be lived to him. For the wrath of God, in verse 18, he goes from the righteousness of God to the wrath of God is also revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Now, they're not the same. Allow me to take this route. Unrighteousness and ungodliness is not the same. Unrighteous people are not the same as ungodly people. They're not the same. He says unrighteousness and ungodly. Now, that's, that's, that's saying a lot. Unrighteousness and un ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What is ungodliness? No one that attends any church in America will consider themselves either one of these. Ungodliness and unrighteousness. But then Paul goes on to say, if we begin to read, he says this. He says in verse 21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. Even though they knew God, ungodly people know God, unrighteous people know God, but we don't look at it that way. Here's what Scripture is teaching us. Ungodliness, it is a neglect or a violation of our duty toward God. Anytime you neglect or you violate anything God asks us to do, you become ungodly. Ungodly. It's a violation, a transgression. Anytime God says, thou shall or thou shall not, to violate anything God says, you're considered ungodly to God. Whether it's a rule or whether you violate a promise or whether you do something God say don't do or you don't do something God say do, that's ungodliness. Now, it seems like a very, what I would call a harsh thing sometimes. But as James told us a little earlier, all of our li lives should be lived for the glory of God. We should make plans based on what? God's will for our lives. Living without any thought of God and our dependence on him. When you can go by through day by day by day without any thought of God, you may mention him, man, praise the Lord, you may mention it, but you really don't have deep in your heart a thought or dependence on God. When you break any of God's laws, you're ungodly. Any one of them, you're ungodly. The, the Jewish Bible puts it this way. What is revealed is God's anger from heaven against all the godliness, godlessness, and wickedness of people who in their wickedness, they suppress the truth. Unrighteousness, then, is sinful action. Whether it's thought, whether it's word, whether it's deed, it's sinful. When one falls short of God's righteousness, unrighteousness does not come large or small. This is where we make our turn. There is no small righteous, and there's no large righteous. There's no small unrighteousness, neither is there a large unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 5, verse 17 tells us, all unrighteousness is sin. Transgression. How do you transgress the unrighteousness, unlawfulness? It is a transgression. What is a transgression? When you have a course to take that God has given us and you deviate from the course, you step in over a line of what you're doing, you stop in short of the goal, that's called you transgress. You didn't follow what God laid out to follow. You are a transgressor. Any deviation from God's course, from God's word, from God's instruction is called a transgression. 
This is what God wants us to, to, to really take a look at today. So, there's to us small transgressions and large transgressions. James says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he has become guilty of all. And that's why I got trapped, in a sense. And here's where Satan traps most people, because we categorize transgressions. We put sin in groups, but God doesn't. The man who is a mass murderer, if he doesn't repent, will get the same punishment as the man who never thought about killing somebody, but he speaks evil of people. It's the same in God's sight. It's, it's, it's the same. So, listen, listen, listen to what James is saying. This is where we get trapped because it is here where Satan wants us to belittle our sins so that we won't look as bad as those bad sinners. Now, this is a trick of the devil. This is a trick. You have to belittle your sin in order to see other people's sin. When Jesus told his disciples there in John, he said, the prince of this world cometh, he's got nothing in me. He was speaking in reference to Judas who was on his way with the Roman soldiers. The prince of this world cometh, but he's got nothing in me. He's got no control over me. He's got nothing in me. And I start thinking about that. Think about this. Why didn't Jesus see the way the Pharisees saw? Why didn't Jesus see people that were doomed for destruction and he just pushed them on over there. Why didn't Jesus see all the wrong? And why didn't Jesus see that sinful woman at the well? Why didn't Jesus say something to that woman caught in adultery? Why? Because there was no wrong in him. You cannot see what other people see if it's not in you. Jesus saw wrong in nobody. Why? There was no wrong in him. And Satan wants us to be little out. He don't want you to get rid of it. He wants you to suppress it. Oh, you're not as bad as that. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you would never do something like that. Yeah, Satan, you have to really back down now. We know your game. If it's not in you, you can't see it. Now, I have to be little of mine. Listen to what I'm saying. I have to think little of mine to point the finger at somebody else. When scriptures say all have sinned. Now, this is our life. This is what God is transforming us from so we could be like Christ. So we could be like who now? Like Christ. When we belittle our sin, we regard our sins as less important. What I'm doing is less important. You downplay it in a sense. Satan wants you to feel you're all right with God because you wasn't as bad as other people. Come on, you're all right. Come on, come on. You're all right. You, you, you all right. I'm not as bad as that. But James said, let me remind you again, James 2.10, if you... Keep the whole law and break one, you what? Say it with me. Guilty of what? All. all of them. All. So there's no little sin. There's no small sin. There's no categories God put us in. Either you're righteous or you're unrighteous. That, that, that's all God sees. A liar is no different than a mass murderer or, or whatever heinous crimes out there, it is no different. A gossiper is no different. It's no different. You are just as sinful. This is how God sees it. Now, this is when transformation will come, 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 come to play, when we can see what God is doing with us. 
Jesus always had problem with the Pharisees because the Pharisees downplayed their own wrong so that they will not have to follow Jesus. We all right, Jesus. Jesus said, you're not all right. You, you're not all right. You're hypocrites. He called, Jesus called them something, everything, trying to get them to open their eyes, but they didn't. And this is why so many people feel like what I'm doing is okay, but you're not okay if you break one of them. One of them. We're going on in what he says. Satan wants you to think you're not that bad after all. Come on. You're not that bad. Go on and continue your church life. Go on. Well, here's what Scripture teaches us. There are no bad and extra bad sins. All unrighteousness is what? Sin. God calls it sin. It's sin. Then what is what, what, what he says? God sees all sin as worthy of death. All sin. You, you can see now how gracious and kind God is. When we hold inventory of ourselves, none of us have any business sitting up in here. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All unrighteousness. Everything you've said, everything you've done, it's all, if it wasn't lined with the Scripture, it was sin. But God allows us to keep going and going and going, and one day we're going to run into the truth of his word. And everything going to start changing about us. Let, let, let me move on. There are no bad and extra bad sins. God sees all sin worthy of what? Death. Small talk that God prohibits to cold-blooded murder, all the same to God. It's all the same. There's no wrong that God overlooks. In Exodus chapter 34, the first part of that, verse 7, keeping lower law for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means live the guilty unpunished. But by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Sin is a very serious thing with God. It most certainly is. So what did he do? It's, it's bad. It's bad. Unrighteousness, ungodliness, all of this. What did God do? He gave us Jesus. He gave us Jesus to take every sin from his sight. This is what clears us. Jesus. This is what allows God to be pleased with us. It's, it's, it's not where you are. It's what Jesus has done. It's Jesus. He has given us Jesus to take away every sin from his sight. Jesus is the only sinless man who ever walked this earth, the only sinless man, the only one was Jesus. And this is the remedy for every unrighteous and ungodly person. This is the remedy, Jesus. He is the remedy. God himself works in us to do what? Cure us from every fault, every failure, every sin, uh, in any human who comes to him through faith in Jesus, God wipes the record clean. Bam! You're whiter than snow. Yes. Well, I'm in this old sinful world again. It doesn't take long for some of that whiteness to disappear. <laughs> this, is, this, this is the way it works. I am in this world. I'm challenged every day to say something, to get mad with somebody, to blow your horn. Like, like you could cause traffic to just disappear. <laughs> We're very impatient. It's just certain things we don't like. Little, little things like telling somebody how you feel or acting a certain way on the job. But then on Sunday morning, oh, thank you, Jesus. Listen, you never went by Jesus. This is an everyday. What I want to point out here is this is an everyday thing. 
every single day, at the end of the day, at the beginning of the day, at the middle of the day, you have to pray and ask God to keep me, to keep me. Listen, listen, listen to what he says. In Philippians 1, 21, Paul says, For to me to live is Christ. This is the remedy. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Here's how the Amplified Version puts it. He is my source of joy, my reason to live. It's the only thing we're living for. To live is Christ. Listen at those words just a minute. You, 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 you hear, hear what he's saying? To live is Christ. To me, to live is Christ. To live with Christ. No, that's not what he says. To live for Christ. That's not what he said. He said, to live is Christ. I'm not living for Christ. I'm not living with Christ. For me to live is Christ. Yeah, I'm living for Jesus. You need to change that. You start, you don't start living for him. You need to let him live in you. To live is Christ. I live with Christ. To live with Christ is to love Christ. Here's what he said, Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. It's not me. And this is the challenge that we face, is the me that lives now have to learn how to die, have to learn how not to take things the way I used to take things. It is the me, he says, I have been crucified. Listen to what he says. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. It's not me, it's Christ. Now, that's, that's a, transform, a transforming that must take place. For the rest of our lives, we cannot take any day to lay our responsibility down. You have to be on God every single day. No man will ever exactly be just like Jesus. We might as well get that part straight now. They, they, none of us would be exactly like Jesus, but we have to war the warfare. We have to fight, as Paul said, the good fight of faith. We have to die on a daily basis. We have to die every situation. I have to die to that. If I fail there, I have to ask God to forgive me, and I have to keep on. This is every day, people. How can we live every single day without being challenged to Christ living in us? How can you do it? You can't do it. Every day, it's a constant, constant walk with God. You are constantly praying. You're constantly, forgive me, Lord. I shouldn't have said that to that man. I shouldn't have did that. I flipped him off. I'm sorry, Lord. You got to help me with that, Lord. You got to do this thing regularly every day. Every day. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. Now, we, we're going to take Jesus and put him on the spot. You're going to bring Jesus into a big argument. As a child of God, say, Christ lives in me. Watch what the Scripture teaches us. 1 Corinthians, he says, 11.1, 1, become imitators of me, even as I am of Christ. Or it really reads, keep becoming imitators of me. That means something, that this life is progressive. It goes on and on and on, day by day. It's a progressive life. That's what the transforming life is. It's progressive. You shouldn't be the same person you were back in January. To, you're not living off that same food you ate in January. <laughs> See, you have, to, you have to really progressively keep yourself healthy and stable. You just can't do it one time and that's it. This life... Is a life 
of continuous improvement, continuously. There, there's improvement, and then there's what? There's change. This life moves towards better conditions. It may not seem like it, and God directs this life. So the life Paul is following as he followed Jesus is not the life of a good man. It's not the life of somebody he chose, say, I want to follow this man. I want to learn from this man. That's, that's not who Paul was following. What Paul, who Paul was following was Christ, who is what? The incarnate God. This is where we have to settle down now. He's the incarnate God. Here's what Ephesians 5, 5, 1 say. We are God's beloved children. We are God's beloved children. Imitate God as his dear children. You ought to be just like your father. You have his spirit. You have his mind. You have his power. You have his love. He said, imitate God as his dear children. Now, how do I do that? He answers that in 1 Thessalonians 2, 14. What did he say? You suffered. This is what you tell the people in, in, in the church of Thessalonica. You suffered at the hands of your own countrymen without complaint. Without complaint. You suffered at the hands of your own countrymen without complaint. Without complaint is the part where they imitated Christ without complaint. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep before a shearer is dumb, yet he opened not his mouth. Maybe there may be some time that we take some things and we're going to complain and we're going to let people know how we feel about it, but this is a progressive life with Christ living inside. You're going to get to the point, or you should get to the point where you don't complain no more. And this is what he said. This is how we follow Christ. You know you're following Christ when you stop complaining. You stop complaining. You suffered without complaint. Without complaint is to imitate Christ in his church. Christ didn't complain. He didn't say one word. The prince of this world cometh, he's got nothing in me. You know, you know what he's saying? He got no power over me. And whatever I go through, God send me to it. So what I'm going to complain about? He said not one word. He didn't try to defend himself. He didn't try to do anything because he knew God was directing it. In Philippians 1, 21, listen, to live is Christ. Galatians 2, 20, he says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, imitate me even as I am also of Christ. So here's what I want to bring this down to. What is he really saying? The longer we live and follow Christ, the more people should see Christ in us. That's the process. If you're following Christ, it may take a while, but people should see what now? That, that, that's, that's, that's what it is. We could tell when people are healthy. We can tell when people are not so healthy. We can tell when people are growing. Oh, is that boy getting big? Why? Because the last time I saw him, he wasn't that size. So he's growing. The talk among Christian people is, you know, sister so-and-so is really changing. Christ is really in her life. That's church talk. <laughs> you know, I, I just think I, I could see the change in brother so-and-so. He didn't used to be like that. Man, he's calming down. No, that's Christ working in him. That's, that's, that's what that is. Do you notice the change Christ makes in your life? It was Christ who was visible in Paul. That's, that's who they saw. See, the transformation of Paul, the transformation of Paul who went from somebody who murdered people who didn't believe what he believed, who actually put them to death because they believed in Jesus, and he didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. He went from one extreme to the other. So the transformation of Paul was what Jesus was doing in him. What was Jesus doing? He was changing his personality and his character. Wow. 
What does God work on? My personality and my character, which means what? He's bringing Paul around to the point where he would reflect Jesus' personality and Jesus' character. You shouldn't have the same character you had back in January. It should be transforming. It should be moving forward. You shouldn't have the same personality. My personality, Paul changed. He changed like night and day. That's why he said, for me to live is Christ. So the longer I live, the more of Christ you ought to see. When the church of the Lord Jesus would get to this point, the longer we have church, the more Christ-likeness we ought to see produce. The longer we sing, the longer we meet together, all the years of church, what should people see? Christ-likeness. If we're not producing Christ-likeness, we're wasting each other's time. Here's what he says. Our lives should be a reflection of who lives in us. Amen. Hmm. And that's the life, day by day, that takes over our natural life. And that's kind of, that's kind of a way God wants us to see it. The longer you live, the longer you should be like Christ. The longer you live, your personality and your character should change. It should change. Colossians 1, 24 through 27, this is what he says. This, 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 this is a very part of scriptures. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 through verse 27. Paul makes it very, very, very clear to us. 1, 24 through 27. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body which is the church in filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. And what is that, Paul? Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages. Hmm. But has now been manifest to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles. What is that mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. What has happened to him? Is he being suppressed? Is he not being allowed to take over? The old nature wants to rule continuously. He wants to rule. And we have actually allowed him to do that. To do that. But listen at what Scripture teaches us. We proclaim him, admonishes every man, listen, 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 admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete. There's a goal God wants us to reach. And Paul says we are preaching and we're teaching and warning every man so that we may present every man complete. This is what is the product of your transforming power. This is what you have done for these people. And when we face God, we're not going to face God by what we did in the world. We're going to face God by what we allowed him to do and what we didn't allow him to do. You will stand before God to answer to God for what you did and what you didn't allow him to do. Now, that's judgment right there. Judgment is not all about these things that we're talking about. Oh, they're going to hell. They're doing no. Whoa, whoa, let's just wait just a minute. Let's don't be so quick to send people to hell. Let's, let's just, just ease up on hell a minute. This is not the goal of the church to send people to hell. 
to tell them they're going to hell. There's devil to tell us enough we're not going. But listen to what the scripture teaches us. Listen, listen to what he says here. He says, warning every man to present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose, I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works in me. See, God energizes people to energize other people. I'm not here to put you down. I'm not here to slander you. I'm not here to talk. That's not what I'm for. Then I have become an unrighteous man before God. And this is what God is saying. Now, now I have to give an account to God, but here's what we, we labor, that we may present every man perfect, that we may present every man perfect or complete in Christ. That's a ministry. That is a ministry. Listen to what he's saying. In, in, in chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, listen to what he says. For you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God when Christ, who is our life, that's, that's, that's what he wants us to see. The life, the fullness of the life that God wants me to have, it's in Christ. And listen to what he says, when Christ shall appear. Wow. Be revealed, well, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. We're going to look just the same. Christ would be no brighter than what, what, what he has brought me to. We will be just like Christ. Here John says, it does not yet appear what we shall be like, but we do know when he comes, we're going to be what? Just like him. There won't be no 30 watt and 50 watts and 10 watt bulbs. Hey, we all going to be shining. We all going to be shining. That's what we are living for. That's what we have church for. That's why we come together, not to nitpick and find fault. We, we're here to be made complete in Christ. This is what he wants. He's coming back for us. Now, every day of Paul's life, this is what he said, for me to live is Christ. When you wake up in the morning, for me to live is what? It's just like Christ living. Our life focus should be on Jesus and all he commanded us to do. That's our focus. What does Jesus want to do today? I thank you, Lord, for just waking me up as I get up. See, an ungodly man don't think like that. He jumps up and runs. But a righteous man, a righteous man, God is in all his thoughts. Only a fool acts like there is no God. This is what the scripture says, but you know God is your life. You wake up and you do what? You recognize that life. You let Jesus know, I know you with me. I know you're there. You're going to help me and you're going to keep me, keep my mouth shut today. And you're going to help me, Lord. You're going to help me. You're going to be with me. I'm not going to complain because you're my life for me to live. It's Christ, not living for him, but for me to live is Christ. And that's the avenue God wants us to go down. Jesus and all he commanded us to do, that's what our life should focus on. Teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. It's, it's, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. So what did Jesus teach? What, what did he teach? What did he mean when he said, going to all the world, preach the gospel, teaching them how to be successful? He's very specific. Teaching them, hmm, maybe, maybe my Bible is different. Teaching the ones all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, teaching them. Now, this, this is a very, very important passage of scripture at the end of Matthew. Very important. Teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. Wow. What do you say about that? What are we to teach? What Jesus taught. What are we to teach? What Jesus taught. 
No, no, let me back up. We love different types of messages. That's because of what's in us. That's because of what's in us. What did Jesus teach about himself? What did he say about the scriptures? What did Jesus say about sin and humility and money and righteousness and marriage? What did Jesus say about all the things in life that we seem to struggle with? What did Jesus say about God? What did he say about Satan? Well, that's something that God wants us to see. And he wants us to understand Christ is our life. He changes our personality. He changes it. He changes the way we think. He changes it. But we have to submit to him in everything that we do. We have to submit to him. When the church of the Lord Jesus Christ can understand that if we can't see what God did for us, how could we see what he want to do for other people? And I think that's very, very important to understand. We are the church of the Lord Jesus, man. We're here to be transformed. And how is that? It is a progressive work. The more Christ works in us, the more you see a change, then you know that's God working. Let go of the feelings and the emotion. Let go of the habits we have and let Christ do his work in us. A amen? I want you to stand with me as we pray. I want this to be a week of you, you, you praying that God will begin to work. I'm, I'm not ungodly. I'm not unrighteous. I'm not ungodly. I don't transgress. I don't go beyond what God say, say go. I don't do what God say not do. But let's just say you did do it. The pressure was just... A little too much, and I had to really let this guy know I, I'm not playing. And I say some things that Jesus didn't tell me to say. Mm. I was almost there Saturday. I was almost, I tell you. Yeah. You know, the people did a little work at my house. And they didn't do what they said they were going to do. And I don't know if Jesus had left me at that moment or not. <laughs> I know he didn't. I, 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 it was me not wanting to yield. Now, don't, don't tell me it doesn't happen now. It happens more often than not. Sometimes we just can't hold our tongue. I know where there you go. Sometimes, sometimes our feelings are not in check. Come on, reality is reality. You're going to cross the line. And just, just go to God every day. Paul said, I keep my conscience void of offense toward God and man. And when I do something wrong, I don't try to cover it up. I, I, I want God to know, that was wrong, God. That was wrong. That was so wrong of me. Forgive me. That's what he wants done. Now, don't go back an hour late and do the same thing. <laughs> but I thank God for every time he gives me victory. I thank him because I know it ain't me. I know it's not me. Thank you for the victory, Father. Thank you for your grace, your mercy. Forgive us, Lord God, for all of our transgressions, our ungodliness, our unchristlikeness, forgive us. Help us not to belittle our sins, only to look at the sins of others as if ours is excused. Don't let the devil trick us like that, God. Don't let him have us thinking, because I thought wrong, I'm much different than the person who acted wrong. This all sin before God. You said in your word, it's all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness is sin. But Lord God, you sent Jesus. You sent Jesus to live not around us. You sent Jesus not for us just to talk about and preach about. You sent Jesus to live inside of us who Christ becomes our life. And we have to learn how to let the old Adam die 
all of his ways and all of his actions and all of his emotions, they must die. Help us in Jesus' name. We are a transformed people. We are moving towards the fullness that is in Christ Jesus. We are moving towards Christ's likeness like never before. And oh God, have mercy on us. Don't let Satan pray that trick on you or belittling your sins or minimize them. Mine's not that large. Don't let him play that trick. Now he got both sides trapped. You're not going to confess because you think you're right, and the other's not going to confess because nobody won't go to them and show them they're wrong. I pray for God to help us. The devil is a lie. The devil is a lie. Don't let him trap you with the, with the deeds and the words. Don't let him trap you with the little things that go on. You stand up before God. You acknowledge this. Let's walk like men and women who know God. Let's walk like men and women who the Holy Spirit works through. In the name of Jesus, Christ is our life. And we're going to... Speak and teach all things he has demanded us. Thank you for our lovely mothers, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the church. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now I want to just take just a moment for us to pray. Pray a prayer of forgiveness. Just let God know if you have downplayed some things in your life, if you have overlooked them and looked at others, ask God to forgive you of that. If you break one, you break them all. If you break one, John said you're guilty of them all. Lord God, help us to make that a reality in our lives, to understand that, to, to accept that, Lord God, and we're going on from there in Jesus' name. Hear our prayer, oh Lord God, as we pray now. And I want you to take this moment and I want you to pray to God. I want you to let Christ know that he is your life. Christ to me, to live is Christ. Christ lives in you. Christ is your life. Christ directs you. He's there. He's never going to leave you. He is my life. My personality and my disposition is being transformed into Christ-likeness. Let God know. As you pray to him, let's take a moment. You ask for forgiveness. He said, I'm not going to clear the guilty. Forgive us, Lord, as we move forward in Christ-likeness. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, God, you know the enemy has been defeated at the cross. He will not have dominion over us. And Father, you have made it clear. I can't see if it's not in me. I can't find fault because fault is not in me. I can only see through that which is in me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for being my life. Thank you, Lord, for helping me not to complain. But to walk as you've asked me to walk, regardless of the situation, the times, the pressure or the people. I bless you and I thank you in Jesus' name. We're on our way to a greater depth of transformation. That's where we're headed. I don't minimize nothing no more. I don't minimize it. I want God to know. I want all of him. And I want to see him when my days are done on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. The people of God said amen. 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 Before we go, I've, 